Hello and welcome back. We're now into ASL 201. Still learning advanced squad leader, but we're going to start trying to uh, work our way into more advanced subjects. This time, session 9A, I've broken these up into two. We're going to talk about indirect and direct fire. In other words, using the to hit modifiers. Session 9A, this session, is going to talk about using mortars. We have a lot of mortars in ASL. And they're a fun little weapon. Sometimes they can be very frustrating, and other times they can do dynamic things and turn entire games around. But to do that, you need to know how to use them. And while I'm only talking about how to fire them this time, there's a lot more to mortars than just firing them. But this time we are going to learn how to fire mortars and hopefully hit your targets. So if you're ready, let's go! Now, the goals for this session, we're going to actually use mortars, we're going to use the to hit number, and then we're going to learn how to modify the to hit number. We're going to be using HE, and because it's a mortar, we're going to be using area fire and working with that. And then, as you've noticed in the last few I've done, when I give you something to shoot at, we're going to remind ourselves of other rules we've already learned. In this case, we're going to take a look at counter exhaustion, the CX that I've got mentioned down there. So those are the goals. It sounds like a lot. I'm still going to try and wrap it up fairly quickly if we can, and then you can always go back and go over this again, because we're now moving into something where you're going to have a lot of tables to look at. So I'd like you to run through it the first time with me. You can always come back and run through it again. That's why we're doing these on on PowerPoints where you can move them backwards and forwards or just run the entire thing. Ready? Let's get started. Oh, I still have a couple other goals. We're going to learn the difference between a support weapon and a gun. And a support weapon mortar specifically is what we're going to be using. So while we're moving on to this next slide, I want you thinking, what defines that it's a support weapon? Okay, so it is a support weapon because it's a small counter. You know, you've got it on the half-inch counter, and you can see it here. Uh, we're behind the wall in the graveyard with a with this lowly little 247 German. Now I know, again, my counters are pretty old, and they look kind of gray rather than blue. These are German troops. This poor little 247 half squad is facing three, count it, three airborne squads out there. And right now, he may not even have line of sight to any of them, possibly. Uh, he'd have to be able to draw that, but he's cowering, he, he's not really cowering, he's hiding behind this stone wall, just waiting for these guys to come and get him. So, now I made a big deal about this being a support weapon, and the reason I did is because there's special things about mortars that are support weapons that we need to know. So, first we know that mortars are going to use indirect fire. Now what that means for us is it does use a to hit die roll. In other words, it's not a direct IFT fire like when we fire a machine gun. We have to get the hit first and then we resolve that hit on the infantry fire table. Now, because we're using a mortar, a mortar is always firing area target type, but unlike any other gun, mortars retain their rate of fire when they use, uh, when they fire using area fire. You'll find all other guns when they fire area fire, oh, sorry, that's, that's uh, a one-shot deal. So, we're going to keep their rate of fire. Now, we're not going to do it this time, but you should read up. You'll also know you can use spotted fire with mortars. In other words, you could have somebody up in a building uh, and thus not expose your mortar itself to fire. You could have somebody at the base of that building firing a mortar. Now, here's the big difference when it's a support weapon. A support weapon mortar does not have a covered arc. That's number one. There's no covered arcs. We can fire in a 360 degree circle with that mortar. We don't have to say, oh, I'm firing out this arc side. Number two, 
they can be fired by a half squad or a squad with no penalties. When we move into guns, you're going to see that guns have to have a true crew. They can't use a half squad. They can't use a squad. They need. They can, but they'll have penalties for doing so because they're non-qualified troops. A support weapon, your half squad or squad is qualified, so no penalties there. Now one thing I don't say here, uh, a mortar cannot fire out of a building. You, you need to realize that. Mortars are indirect fire, so they're firing up. So no putting them in buildings. You can't fire them out of there. Later on when you get to uh, red barricades, you'll find you can put them on rooftops. Always nice up there, but you cannot put them in a building and fire. So, so to reemphasize, here's the things to remember with support weapon mortars. They have no cover dark. They can be fired just fine by a half squad or squad with no penalties. Now we're worrying about learning how to fire these weapons, so the next step with this is going to be guns. So I'm telling you this because a gun, which is on the 5 8 inch counter, requires a, a crew to be fired with no penalties. All right. And last item, support weapon mortars are on half inch counters, which is another way of saying there are uh, mortars that are on 5 8 inch counters, right? And then what's the other thing about mortars? Mortars are firing area fire automatically. They're going to use a to hit to get the hit, and then they are going to resolve on the IFT. Since it's area, that IFT fire is what? Halved. You got it. So with that, we're ready to get, get started here. We're looking at a German support weapon mortar. Uh, we can tell it's mortar, MTR. Uh, what caliber is it? It's 50 millimeter. And we're looking through here on that 50. Notice it's telling us it only fires high explosive, HE. And it's halved because it's a mortar on area fire for IFT. Cool. So we know those two things. Just a few other things to be aware of. Number one, it's got a high rate of fire that makes these very powerful little weapons. They may not, you know, the 50 millimeter mortar is, is uh, can be pesky, but you're going to find that it has certain places and certain uses, and it really does a, does a good job of deterring uh, the enemy, especially in wooded areas. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, a key thing about this, notice there is a range limitation here. The range limitation, you can't fire it closer than two hexes, and you cannot fire it further than 13 hexes. So it is just a support weapon. It's a, it's a little squad weapon, and it's got the ability to only reach out a certain distance. So you can't fire them one hex away, and you can't fire them at 14 hexes. We'll see that that does have some impact. Now, I have another line here. It says maybe dismantled to move. What tells you that's important? It's the one thing I don't have an arrow to, and that's that five portage points. It's very heavy um, as a mortar when they're put together. So you can dismantle them, as, and you do that by saying, well, instead of firing it, I want to dismantle this. And then you can carry it at a lower portage point cost. And the way the portage point works is how? A squad has three portage points that they can, inherent portage points they can carry. So this five would subtract, it's two over their portage limit, so that squad would lose two movement factors, wouldn't it, if they were trying to carry this, or a half squad. So realize it can be dismantled to move. Now the reality is, in most of our games, we'd like to get our mortar set up in the right place before we start firing it and then leave it there, because they do have an, a nice punch uh, in certain circumstances. And then the last item, and I'm drawing your attention to it because it's hard to see on, on these uh, small half-inch counters, but notice between the 50 and the bracket, it's kind of a smudge in this shot, but that's really an asterisk, and the asterisk is telling us this is a short-barreled weapon, and that will become important to us in a little bit. So, here we go. Well, we're looking at the scene. This is German defensive fire. 
Now, for the most part, mortars are a little better at longer range, and we're going to see what that means because we have to know how to use our mortars. But I'd just like you to look this over. We see we've got three full squads coming at us, and we've got one little lowly half squad here with a with a mortar. So um, it's not looking too good for him, right? He's behind that uh, stone deal. Now, right now, he can't even probably can't say for sure, but he probably can't even see any of these other people on the board right now. So, now when I say that mortars in general are better at long range, let's take a look at what I mean by that. And to do that, we have to go take our first look at what is really the two-hit table, the C3 table. And these are on your blue charts, if you're looking. They're also on the quick, uh, the QDRC chart, so... Mortars have their own line on the C3, the C3 to hit table. Um, so on this to hit table, we have what we're shooting at for the most cases. Are we shooting at a vehicle? Are we shooting at infantry? Or are we shooting area fire? Now it tells us right here that mortars always fire on the area fire line, don't they? So do smoke always fire on that area fire line. So we see that for the, if we just look across this table, we can tell that it's a 7 out to 12 hexes, but suddenly it turns into an 8 above 12 hexes. Now it goes back to 7 after that, but in other words, you can reach about half the board uh, and have an 8 to hit as a starting number. That's pretty good. So, mortars, better at a little longer range. And I'm only telling you that because there will be a time you're going to want to think about that when you're getting ready to start. Isn't necessarily true on the support weapon, um, in this case, for the Germans, because why? Because it had that asterisk that we said was a short barrel. We'll get to that in a moment. So here we go. It's the American movement phase, meaning we are going to have a chance for defensive first fire if we see anybody. And we're going to get started with this right away. The 747, which is currently out of sight to us in G10, has decided he needs to get closer faster. And to do that, he's going to declare double time. And thus, that's a CX. What's that mean? Well, it gets him a CX counter. We see that. Uh, what that means, though, is, is he's running. He's charging forward. He's, he's uh, expending more energy. And because he announced it before the turn started, because he announced it before the turn started, it gives him two extra movement factors. If he had waited until after he had made his first movement factor, uh, then he, if he declared it then, he'd only get one extra movement factor. Now the little counter stays with the unit till the end of the next movement phase and that prevents you from declaring uh, counter exhaustion back to back. Can't do it. Uh, you, you cannot have consecutive turns of counter exhaustion. So uh, you've got to rest up in between essentially and move at a normal pace. So that's why the CX counter is there and that's also why it's white. Back to the, back to the action. He's declared his CX, and he's going to move into the woods at H9, spending two movement factors. Going to run down our throat, but wait a minute. He's moved into the woods for two points, and now, of course, the 247 with the mortar can see him. He announces a mortar shot for his defensive first fire. And, of course, this is very important for him um, because the woods is going to give him some additional benefit. We need to start breaking this down to be he's not firing his his half squads inherent firepower because being a half squad he can either fire his support weapon or fire his in, inherent fire so he's firing the support weapon instead it's defensive first fire he's triggering it on the first movement point as the as the 747 steps in the woods we said that mortars have their own line and we counted that up. It is six hexes. It's actually five, I think. And uh, on that line, you should be able to do this. It's the mortar line, which is area. And it's six or less, so that's what for a two-hit number. 
It's a nice 7, isn't it? That worked well. So it is 0 to 6, only one number hit value 7. Now we go on to the second half of that table, which is the C4 table. And notice C4 gun and ammo base uh, hit number modifiers. We stay in the same column because we're already on the 0 to 6 column. And we said it was an asterisk gun, didn't we? Well, at this range, being a short barrel gun doesn't hurt us at all. So that's a 0. So no modifiers there. So we got our base to hit, 7. And now we've modified that with a 0. Right? So off the to hit table, came up with 7. So with that, we also should have noticed on the 0 to 12 range, there's really no modifications on the C4 table unless we happen to be firing smoke. And at 12 and above, that's when the mods start. You get long barreled, extra long barreled guns, that's the L and double L. And they can get help because they're good at longer ranges. So they can get a plus one or even a plus two for the double L. And short barrel guns are penalized after 12 hexes. Then there's also some ammo issues uh, that, that have problems at longer range. But we'll get into that some other time. So for the indirect fire, we got the modifier of 0. OK, C3 and C4 have given us the modified to hit number of 7. Remember that number. You must roll less than or equal, equal to the modified to hit number to get a hit. C3 and C4 give you that number. C5 and C6, our next set of tables, are creating the modifiers to our die roll. So we've got our modified to hit. Now we're coming up on these next steps with our modifications for the dice roll we make to get that 7 to whatever the number would happen to have been. All right? These are die roll modifiers that will go against our modified to hit value. So to do this, we have to work our way down these. And notice the A, the B, the C, C1, 2, 3, 4, all the way down. So we're going to work our way down. Anytime we're using any kind of a gun that uses a to hit number, we work our way through these, and you'll find it becomes second nature. You don't even really have to look at these. Now, the first one up, fire or outside covered arc, per hex size change. Does that matter to us? That doesn't matter to us at all, does it? Because squad weapon mortars don't care about, I, I should say support weapons don't care about uh, covered arc. That's what I told you off the very start, right? They have a 360 degrees range uh, to look out. So um, A is not applicable to this case. How about B, firing in the advancing fire phase? We're not firing in the advancing fire. This is defensive first fire, so there's nothing about B. And C is also true, right? We're not a bounding fire, so none of the Cs apply. Now also, you need to start watching for these items out in front. You see them off to the left of the C's. You see them on C1 through C4, E, G, and L. They've got that little cross, and if you look on your chart, you'll see that little cross tells you none of these apply to area fire. Is that cool? So if they don't apply to the area target type, I don't even look at them for C. I don't have to look at D, or excuse me, I don't have to look at E, which was fire within. So we got to keep going down here. There they are, just in case you couldn't see them. D, this is what would happen if you had a pinned person, because we're no longer using pinned as half firepower, because now we're firing a gun. So if they're pinned, there's a penalty, and that is um, a plus two. And notice also that's where our spotter comes in. So not pinned, don't have to worry about that. 
and it tells us E doesn't count, right? F, we're not firing intensive fire, which is when you've exhausted your rate of fire, right? Um, if you choose to do intensive fire, we're not doing that, so that doesn't count. And we're down now to case H, which is captured non-qualified infantry. Tells us what we do, but I said it's not a captured weapon. We're German. It's German, right? And it's not non-qualified because it's not a 5 8 inch counter gun, is it? It is a support weapon that'll that's allowed by infantry use, so that doesn't count either. So we get all the way through this entire C5 chart. Did we have any modifiers for that? None at all, right? Is that good news? Yes, it is for us. It's not necessarily so good for our friend the, the 747. But we're not through yet. Since we're through with that, with, with modifiers of zero, we go on to table six. That's target based. Well, J starts right out. J tells us moving or motion vehicle or dashing infantry. It would be harder to hit them, wouldn't it? Well, it doesn't count in our case because the infantry is moving, but it's not dashing, right? So that doesn't count. Now, because it wasn't against a vehicle, we can skip right over J1 and J2, but we do worry about J3 and J4, right? J3 does apply. The target is not assault moving, so that's J3. That's a minus one, right? And the trees stop J4 because it's not open ground. So, boom. There we are. We've got our first minus, and we keep going. Now, here's this entire group. We see that K, conceal target, now, area fire doesn't count in this case for a C4, but if it were concealed as a, as a question mark counter, we'd have to add to, to hit it. But they're not concealed, so that doesn't count. Point blank does not apply to area fire, so we don't have that. By the way, you'll notice the point blank means one hex away or two hexes away. Two hexes is a minus one. One hex away would be point blank, but those don't apply to us, right? So, M, hmm, bore sighted location. Well, we don't know exactly what a bore sighted location is, but we don't have one, so forget that. N, acquired target. Well, that's what happens after you've shot at somebody once, so it doesn't count here. So, uh, we have nothing off that. And uh, target using hazardous movement? Nope, we don't have that either. So we're through all of those. Now, the target modifier, target size modifier in P, that if we were firing at a vehicle or a gun, we'd worry about that. These are people. We're firing at a squad, so it doesn't count. Now, it does say TEM. But you'll notice, and you can't see it now, but there's a little cross out front. TEM does not apply to area fire on case Q. So they don't get a TEM. They don't get the trees, do they? Pretty cool. And there's no hindrance. There's no smoke. There's no uh, grain. There's no uh, limited visibility going on. So there's no hindrance to apply. But if any of those did apply, this is where we'd put them on. So all we probably have is what? The minus one for his non-assault movement, correct? So now we've got the modified to hit die roll of seven with a minus one die roll modifier, and that's it. So are you ready? Shall we find out what happens? Look at that. It's a seven. Colored die is what? What's that mean? It means that the mortar retained rate of fire. Now remember, under normal area fire, you could not retain rate of fire, but mortars can. So 7 minus 1 is a 6. That is equal to or less than our modified die roll modifier, or modifier to hit roll, right? That was the 7. So we took, we rolled a 7, 
minus 1 is a 6, definitely below that number. So now we have to resolve it. So first we got to decide what is the firepower. It was a 50 millimeter mortar, but it's also area fire. And we said we resolve this on the IFT because it's mortar area fire. You ready? So first we find the column that has the high explosive equivalency of that gun size. And we see that the 50 is next to the 6. So it's the equivalent of 6 firepower factors on the IFT. But this is area fire. What's that mean? It means we have to divide the 6 in half. You don't divide the the you don't divide the gun size. You divide the IFT result. So the IFT was 6, goes down to a 3. There's no 3 column, so it drops to the 2, doesn't it? And that 2 tells us what we have to roll on. But we're not quite through yet. Whenever you're firing area, you don't include the TEM as part of the to hit die roll. You include the TEM as part of the results die roll. So if you'd been firing on a building, they'd get the plus of the building. If you'd been firing on a, on a wall, we'll see what happens with that later. You add the TEM to the results. But here is one of those big pluses for indirect fire, and mortars fire indirect, correct? One of the big pluses for indirect fire, if it's versus infantry, or crew exposed vehicles or open top vehicles, if they're in woods, you get an air burst. The mortar is hitting the wood and it's showering down the shrapnel as it explodes up there. It's, it's hitting the tree and firing. So that's a minus one TEM if, they're, if the infantry or the vehicle is in the woods if it's if the crew are exposed. So minus one TEM instead of the plus one for the woods. So when we go to resolve this, we're going to take a minus one off that. So we were on the two column, minus one, we got to roll to see what it is. We got the two hit, now we have to roll to get the effect. And the effect is a five. Since we have a minus one, that makes it a four. And a four on the two column, a lowly two column, we got a one morale check, didn't we? Woo! Now, when the American rolls, up, oh, got a seven. Plus one for that one morale check is an eight. They're broken. And we're going to get rid of that CX, break them, and put the DM on. So that's one way to lose the CX marker. Now, we're also putting something else on that you may not have seen before. That's that minus one acquired marker. Remember when we were going through there, it asked us if we had acquired a target? This is called, this is called acquiring the target. We saw, we hit the range, and the guys go, that's it, that's where you want it at. Stay at that point and keep feeding items into the tube. Now, if we wanted to, could we fire again? Yes, we could, because it is defensive first fire, and he used more than one point, didn't he? But the truth is, for this mortar, he knows he's still got two squads, so he probably thinks, I'm going to wait and see who else moves. Uh, I'm going to worry about them. It doesn't do me any good to... Uh, literally go ballistic on the broken squad in the woods, I need to worry about the guys who are in front of me. By the way, the half squad is going to get our first fire marker, not the mortar. Why only the half squad? The half squad fired the mortar. The mortar has not exhausted its rights to use fire. It got rate of fire, didn't it? So why don't we put the first fire counter on the mortar? Retained its IROF. Can we shoot the broken unit again? Yes, we can. It only it expended two so movement factors, so we could shoot again. 
could we fire at some other unit? Only if they move this phase. That's because it's defensive first fire. Now remember, since I don't have a marker, uh, could use that in the final fire phase. So we're passing on firing at him. We're back to movement phase. And the 747 that is in I-8 is going to assault move to J-7. He's creeping up there behind the hedge. Can you calculate this hit? There we go. He's in place. Let's start working it out. First of all, do we have to worry about range? He's out. He's He's above one hex away. He's within our 2 to 13, so that's not a problem. Ready to calculate? Okay. We have to know a little something about the mortars. Now, we know that it started out as a 7, because it's 0 to 6 on the mortar was a 7, wasn't it? Don't have to worry about the gun size, so we know all that. Our modified to hit number is a 7. Now we have to worry about firer-based penalties, and we know when we went through that before, none of those applied. And, or, and uh, we've got target-based penalties, and the target-based penalty, there's no first fire non-assault this time because the assault moved. He's not in the open because he's got the hedge, right? So since TEM doesn't count, on the two hit because it's area fire, it's going to end up being a straight seven, isn't it? And this time he rolled a five, still with rate of fire. Okay, now, just like last time, we have to go ahead and do the resolution on the IFT. But here's something you need to know about walls and hedges. We're not firing directly into the wall or directly into the hedge, are we? When we use a mortar, it's going up. Remember my ballistic statement? It's going up and dropping back down on them. So they get a little bit of benefit from walls and hedges. It's reduced by one from their TEM. So if they were behind a wall, it would go from a two to a one. But these guys are behind a, a hedge. The hedge goes from 1 to 0. Now remember, on the to hit, we said they weren't moving in the open because they weren't. They were behind the hedge. For us to see them, we were looking through the hedge, so they had cover. But for the resolution, there is no, it, it turns out to be a 0 value TEM, doesn't it? because we're doing indirect fire with a mortar. Cool? So, now we've got the hit, we've got the two firepower plus zero, and we rolled a five. Five on what? Uh, well, we already decided it's two firepower because we know it was six and dropped down to the two, right? So same as last time. And we have to remove the uh, aqua target on the DM and move it down here on this guy because he's what we just shot at. So we're, we can leave the aqua on him or shoot at somebody else. We could end up firing at this guy again, right? So die roll, 2-3, gave us a one morale check. Now, I'm going to ask you a quiz time. The 747 passes the one morale check. Can we shoot him again? That's his pass roll, by the way. He only expended one movement factor, even though he assault moved, so we can't shoot at him. Can we fire at some other unit? Only if they move. We still have rate of fire, and it is defensive first fire phase. So now that final 747 is going to assault move into L8, the building right there. Now, he'd really like to go out to K8 so he can get a fire group with his buddy 747, but, you know, not doing it. He saw what happened to everybody else. He's going to turn around, and he is going to, you know, assault move into that L8 there. And the die roll, bang, it's a 
it's a snake eyes. What the heck does a snake eyes do for us? Do we cower? You know, we talked about cowering last time when we were firing machine guns, when we were firing uh, uh, other IFT weapons. Cowering only counts on IFT fire. This is firing a gun. This is firing a, a uh, an item with a to hit. You do not cower unless you're firing IFT uh, items. So machine guns, anything where you're firing directly on the IFT table. Doubles do cower if you don't have leadership. When you're doing a to hit die roll, it does not. Now, we need to think about this. What would have been the to hit? Did we, you know, we didn't run through everything again. How come? Because it's the exact same to hit as we had last time, isn't it? We start out with the 7. There is no modifier for the gun uh, barrel length. There is no modifier for us on our shooting penalties. And the only modifier is what's the target doing? The target was not moving in the open. The target was assault moving. So no minuses, right? And we said that because it's area fire, we don't take the Tim in the to hit. So we know that our modified to hit number was 7. But we rolled a snake eyes. Big things happen with that. The attack strength is doubled now instead of halved. And the Tim, the TEM, the terrain effects modifier, is reversed. So. On our IFT attack, instead of 6 being halved to 3, it's doubled to 12. And the TEM, which was a plus 3, is now a minus 3. Ouch. So what die roll would make this a 1 KIA? And you should be able to look right at your chart that's on the 12. What do we got to have to get a 1 KIA? So if we roll a 5, we're on the 12 column. 12 column minus 3, 5, 1, 2, 3 is a 1 KIA, isn't it? Now, generally when we're worried about rubbling buildings, because everybody loves to do the neat stuff in this game, could this rubble the building? Sorry, no. The normal rubble rules say that a gun has to be at least 70 millimeter to rubble, and that we don't end up with uh, the possibility of rubble uh, if it's uh, due to a critical hit. But we did get the KIA, so just so you know, I'm going to leave this to you to look up. You could get a possible flame. You could get a possible flame. Not a fire, not a blaze yet. Blazes always start with flame. And you'll notice if you're looking at your A7 infantry fire table, the IFT, if you're looking at the, the big one that's colored, you'll notice you get all these little notes. And there it is, all these little notes here that tell you something. And that double cross is showing you that an original heat or HE heat affects die roll, causes a possible P flame, possible flame creation. And what that is, is the die roll modifier, or if you make a die roll plus the uh, environmental conditions, and if that's greater than or equal to kindling, then, then it's a flame. Now, because it's in a building and it's a stone building, we know what that is, and we could do it. I'm going to leave that all to you to look up. It's not something that happens very often, and it's not the real point of ours. I just want you thinking outside the box so you start to see these cool things that can happen. But don't get excited. You're never going to rubble a building with a 50 millimeter mortar. 81 millimeter mortars, on the other hand, yes, you could. OK, so here we go. Here's my question. What would you learn? The one big thing you should have learned Area fire is always halved on effect, right? We learned that mortars use indirect fire. Direct and indirect fire both are resolved, excuse me, both are set up by using the hit table. You've got to get it to hit number. Now, C3 and C4 give us the base to hit number. C5 and C6 give us positives or negatives to put on our die roll that decide if we 
equal or, or less than or modified to hit, that means it's a hit. So first we use the first two tables to get whatever the possible, the modified hit number is. And that's usually going to be anywhere from a 3 or 4 to a 7. Mortars, you're usually looking up there at the at the 7. Direct fire with guns, it's, you know, depending on whether you're moving or anything like that, um, gets you down to 4 or 5 with most guns. But mortars, you're usually up there. So you get the to hit number first. You get the modifiers next. You make the die roll, subtract the modifiers. If they are less than or equal to that to hit number, boom, you're good, right? But we know that mortars always use area fire after we get the hit, and area fire is always halved. When you get the hit, it's resolved on the IFT. We learned we can't cower, right? Okay. With area fire, the TEM, this is a biggie. With any time we're firing area fire, the TEM is included on the IFT resolution, not on the to hit. Huge. All right. And we also learned, and I don't think I have it written up here, with area fire, any other gun that shoots area fire loses possibility of rate of fire, but mortars retain rate of fire. Okay, both direct and indirect fire use the to hit table. And we saw that on the to hit, we have modifiers for target type, gun barrel, and ammo type. That's to apply to our to hit. The firer based and target based modifiers apply to our die roll. Got it? Then, if you get the hit, resolved on the IFT. With area fire, TEM is included on the IFT resolution, not on the to hit. And we also saw that indirect fire with mortars have some special TEM rules. Wood's TEM against a mortar becomes a minus one, doesn't it? Ooh. Now, hedges and walls TEM, it's their normal TEM, which of course is a plus two or a plus one but you subtract one because you're firing over and dropping the fire on top of them. So wall would become a plus one TEM, hedge would become a zero TEM as we saw in this example. But that TEM does not apply to the to hit, it applies on the IFT resolution, doesn't it? So we have worked our way through mortars, You've spent about 40 minutes at this. I hope you enjoyed it. For further information, you have a small section that you need to read. It's section 2 to 7 in chapter C, and you're reading all of 7. Now, there's some pretty heavy stuff there, but the good news is now that you've seen how it works, all of what you read should be able to be applied. Now, that was a start on fire combat using two hit numbers. We have a lot more to learn, and in fact, on the next set of, of slides that we're going to do, the 9B, we're going to apply all of these exact things that you learned to firing a gun. Yep, one of those 5 8 inch counters, and you're going to see how it's done. So, with that, hope to see you soon.